Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. Good afternoon. Welcome to SmartCon. Um, I'm really excited about this panel today uh, about tokenized assets because it seems like recently everyone's been talking about tokenized assets. I mean, I think we can all sort of see it as the final boss, right? Instead of just playing around with purely digital native assets, we're bringing off-chain assets on-chain. And what makes me really excited about this is that we're, we're joined today by people who aren't just talking about it, but they're building it, and they've deployed tokenized assets. So please give another round of applause to welcome Charlie from RWXYZ, Cynthia from Matrixport, Erwin from Back Finance, and Nick from Fortunify. Thank you. So let's jump right into it, um, because I think we need to set some context. So we'll go down the line. Charlie, starting with you. Why don't you explain a little bit about what you're building at RWXYZ and then help give a definition of what are these tokenized assets that everyone's talking about? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Michael. And I think well, what we're building is the dominant data platform and analytics provider for tokenized assets. So if you ever want to learn, ask, answer uh, the questions, how many tokenized assets are there? What sectors are they in? Who holds them? Who's originating them? Those are all questions that our site, rwa.xyz, aims to answer. And we think that tokenized assets are the technological end game for all asset ownership, asset settlement, and that it's the, the real first sea change in asset ownership since the advent of digital finance in general. And that presents a great opportunity for a data provider to come in and uh, show everyone all of the information that's needed for all financial workflows. Thanks. Cynthia? Yes, so earlier this year, Matrix Port has launched our other way brand called Matrix Doc. And the, the first product we tokenize in real world asset is called Short Term Treasury Bill Token, which is essentially the token representation of a US Treasury Bill, which largely comprises of uh, overnight reverse repo and the uh, short term treasury that's uh, shorter than, with a tenor, shorter than three months. Thanks. Erwin. Yeah, hi. I'm from uh, Bact. Uh, we bring real-world assets on chain as well, um, such as US T bills, but also equities like S&P 500 or Coinbase uh, shares. Um, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks. Excellent. Hey, everybody. My name's Nick. I'm the founder at Fortunify. Um, we are launching just now in October a cross-chain tokenization protocol that allows you to mint and redeem different public and private debt assets on multiple different chains. Uh, and we're starting off on Con Canto, and we'll be on a, several other chains uh, over the course of the year. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everyone. So now that we know a little bit more about what you're working on, what tokenized assets are, why don't we get into what's the big opportunity or use cases for these tokenized assets? And, and really, how can the current DeFi landscape benefit from this? And, and Erwin, I'd love to, to kick it, this off with you, because I know um, there's already some protocols using the assets. That's right. I mean, so um, part of our growth uh, strategy is to uh, embed ourselves in, uh, in DeFi. So um, we um, uh, have a few of these protocols uh, currently already uh, using our tokens. First one was, um, was Ribbon, uh, now AVO. Um, then came uh, um, Angle and finally Bloom. Um, but what, what I was going to say was uh, that actually... Um, DeFi, like real world asset already like power dominates uh, DeFi. When you think about USDC, uh, which is the, the main uh, asset, is a tokenized asset. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it's already the case. Yeah, and um, Cynthia, I'd love to hand it over to you next. Um, you know, how are you seeing uh, STBT being used in, in DeFi? Yeah, so uh, I think it's very important for us is to find a lot of use cases for SDBT in various DeFi protocols. So there's a few uh, uh, areas where we're seeing the interest of collaboration. One is to use SDBT as a trading collateral on the centralized exchanges or decentralized exchanges. The other one is to bring liquidity to the SDBT by uh, potentially accepting it as a lending protocol in some of the lending uh, big lending protocols. The third one is basically use SDBT, which is a, a, a very raw version of uh, off-chain uh, yield uh, to uh, make on-chain money market, ma money market uh, fund or other yield-bearing um, assets on-chain. So that's 
the three areas I have seen so far, and potentially could be also be used as an ingredient, a collateral for uh, yield-bearing stablecoins. That's uh, also some of the new initiative we have seen so far. Yeah. Cool. Um, Nick, Charlie, anything we missed on, on use cases or how DeFi could be using tokenized assets right now? Um, I guess just to add a little bit on both of your points, um, on the point of USDC, right, it is already an asset that is KYC'd and AML'd for minting and redemption. Uh, it's openly transferable, which is broadly a bit of a differentiator, but uh, the concept of USDC really being a derivative of a treasury that is not passing on any yield to its users, uh, and then imagining what distribution in DeFi looks like with underlying T-bills as uh, collateral with a real base yield, and then being able to do different uh, network distributions on top of that, I think is just a really big opportunity that we're going to see a lot of different integrations and opportunities around that uh, over the next six to 12 months. Um, I was also going to add on the stablecoin point that Cynthia was making. Um, you know, we've seen MakerDAO be one of the first that really onboarded a significant amount of RWA assets. Uh, Fortunify, a small plug, was one of the first uh, RWA assets that backed DAI. We brought revenue-based financing assets to back DAI. Um, but what we're seeing now is a adoption of existing protocols that want to onboard these assets and a significant amount of development around new protocols that are being built to custom support these assets and enable more distribution from that as well. So I think really RWA as a utility on chain uh, is where this is really going to hyperscale. One of the things I, I want to add to all, all these points, you know, I think they everyone here covered the what is the use case for DeFi participants cover that extremely well and that's, you know, extra collateral and being able to provide real-world yield into the DeFi ecosystem for on-chain players. But another perspective I want to highlight is the advantages that tokenization brings to traditional finance. And that is mostly for, and really this is, you know, goes to the topic of our talk here, bringing mm -hmm. 100 trillion on-chain. And really, traditional finance players for some instruments like securitizations or even more esoteric structures can save 50 bips, 100 bips over uh, over the current systems that are happening now. I mean, you think of all the intermediaries that are in play, the end game of everything that we're doing here in DeFi is to eliminate a lot of those intermediaries, and in doing so can save 50 bips, 100 bips off of uh, trillions, hundreds of trillions, you know, quadrillions to Sergey's point of value, and see changes in technology have happened for far less money than uh, what's at stake here. Thanks. Yeah, you know what? I want to take a, take a step back, maybe and take a, a macro view of this, because I've been saying tokenized assets. We said RWA is here. I know real-world assets is sort of a funny term, because it's not only so broad, but then it implies that, say, digital assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are not real, which I think a lot of people at this conference will disagree with. So, Charlie, I'm going to bring this back to you, since um, you see a lot of these things. What are the differences between some of the real-world assets, tokenizing these assets, and even incorporating digital assets into that. Yeah, I think that the biggest point that uh, differentiates real-world assets, quote-unquote, tokenized assets from on-chain assets is the fact that its real-world assets are tied to a real-world legal structure and they're enforceable in court. If you have a, to the point of the last panel, if you have a liquid staking derivatives, you get hacked, it goes to a, you can't uh, necessarily just go to the court and have them undo that transaction and get the money back. Uh, it's not doesn't work that way. It's just all on-chain and code is law, and that brings a lot of benefits. But there are simply some of the facts that for sophisticated financial instruments in the traditional financial system, you need the, that sort of permissioning and you need that sort of uh, ability for legal entities to get involved. And I think that's the, that, in, that then leads into a whole host of other necessities for the technology, and I think that's the biggest differentiator. Yeah, I think the real world uh, RWA really stands for bringing the off-chain asset on-chain. And, and so because uh, the underlying asset is off-chain, it actually has a few distinct, distinctive differences uh, compared to the native asset, um, yielding asset. Uh, I, I can think of probably three. The first one is the appropriate legal structure, because what makes the RWA valuable is the underlying, right? So people need to know that by tokenizing it, they still have the ownership of the underlying, regardless of what happens. So that means you need to have a proper, appropriate legal structure that gives the people the confidence that this is 100% bankruptcy remoteness. So this is one unique uh, differentiation from the on-chain 
uh, native asset. The second one is that what is the, because the underlying asset is off off chain, where the token form representation of it is on chain. So how do we establish the relationship to verify that the on chain asset is always uh, backing the on chain representation, right? So this is what we mean by establishing the right on chain transparency. That's actually what Chainlink Proof of Reserve is helping us, uh, us and the, the fellow uh, builders doing is really to establish that relationship uh, dynamically and real time so that people have the confidence that this is representing the underlying, this much underlying that I own. The third part is on chain liquidity, which is probably the more difficult part. The native assets, um, for example, liquid staking uh, derivative. Tips. Their underlying is a native asset, so their liquidity is naturally on chain as well. You have you just need to wait for the unbound periods, and then you have the liquidity. Whereas for RWA, the underlying is off chain, right? So which means you take treasury bill, for example, you will have to wait for U.S. open business hours to trade, uh, to dispose or buy the um, underlying treasury bill. However, when the the RWA is tokenized and become an on chain treasury token, and integrated into various DeFi protocols, people expect it to be 24-7, right? They can't just mm. not do anything during the US uh, closed days, right? Therefore, you have a unique challenge, which is that you have to build on-chain liquidity that support 24-7 trading. So I think that are the three unique challenges we need to address. But if we can address that, this mm -hmm. possess a very big potential for, for the whole industry to scale. Absolutely. So. I'll keep it going down the line. Um, Erwin, you know, in that same note of answering the title question, like how do we unlock that $100 trillion on chain? You know, how do we turn this interest into massive adoption? And, and how are you using the, the Chainlink network to help that? Sure. Um, I mean, and jumping on, on what Charlie said before, it's true that uh, efficiency, you know, has the potential to bring institutions and quadrillions of, uh, of dollars on chain. Um, but I would say right now, our focus, at least at BACT, is more on like uh, giving access to people who don't have. So you can think of populations in LATAM, in Southeast Asia, um, where they don't have you know, the, the resource we have. They don't, they're not banked uh, like we are. And that, has, you know, that, that is a market that we can serve. Um, and efficiency might come in at a later stage, I feel. Um, that's that's how I would see it. Um, then, uh, coming back to your question, um, I mean, when you're bringing RWA on chains, um, there's inherent um, centralization around it. So we're uh, we're a company, um, and that um, introduces you know potential risk and trust issues. And that's where uh, working with uh, Chainlink and uh, Proof of Reserve, for example, um, helps mitigate those, uh, those uh, risks and, uh, and provide you know, trust or trust, a trustless solution uh, to, uh, to, to users. Um, and yeah, very fortunate to, uh, to be working with you guys um, and, um, and yeah, have Proof of Reserve in place so that uh, that everyone can see uh, that we're not minting tokens out of thin air, that there's actually uh, one um, you know, share for each token that we issue. Yeah, um, so back on a high level here on the uh, 100 trillion, uh, it's really not that far off of a, of a guesstimate if you really think about it. Like pretty much all the leading institutions over the last 12 months have published reports projecting 16 trillion or so in the next 10 years of tokenized securities. Uh, and from our understanding, these reports are fundamentally looking at the benefits of securitization on chain, which are these 50 basis point improvements, more or less. Um, what they miss, though, in these reports is the significantly large uh, cost savings from liquidity distribution on chain. So in the context of minting stable coins, in the context of accessing money markets, DEXs, and, and other sort of applications on chain. Um, we did a research report, we came out with 30 trillion, probably still underestimating what really is gonna happen here over the next sort of decade or two. Um, I do think part of the aspect of RWA is really driving utility to these assets, not just holding them on chain. I think everyone on the, on the panel here sort of agrees with that. And so as part of that, 
really it's a liquidity and distribution infrastructure, right? So part of our strategy at Fortunify, and this is one of the things we're working with with Chainlink, is a native cross-chain implementation. Um, so different layer ones, layer twos, rollups can have a direct minting experience on their chain, so users can mint natively, uh, they can redeem natively from those chains, um, and we're looking at CCIP, I think that's a fantastic technology to enable sort of the cross-chain minting and redemption of tokenized securities and stable coins as well. Um, and also similarly with proof of reserve, sort of providing an additional aspect of transparency around the backing and the uh, uh, stability and custody and sort of the mark-to-market of these underlying assets. Um, so I do really think the work that Chainlink here is doing with CCIP and proof of reserve is sort of foundational and why everyone in RWA is working with them here. Thanks. Charlie, I see you're, you're nodding your head a lot to that. I know you have a bird's eye view of a lot of RWAs. Um, so capitalizing on, on the question everyone was saying, like, where do you see some of the growth for this $100 trillion or whatever the, the projections may be? Yeah, right now it's clear that tokenized treasuries have more or less product market fit on the on-chain ecosystem because after all of the on-chain yield that was token farming and, uh, and lending and borrowing against other crypto assets, after a lot of that died down when prices went down, uh, you had to have another source of yield or else there was going to be no more, no more yield on chain. And a lot of these folks, a lot of other folks who aren't in this room stepped in to provide the, the risk-free rate on chain. And from there, you can build all sorts of other financial products, all the DeFi composability, things that uh, we've all experienced over the last uh, few years of innovation. Uh, all of those can come to real assets in, uh, in the way that you know, we all know and love. But I think that the, what's going to go in the, in the long-term future, I think immediately you know, we'll, stable coins, of course, will continue to grow. Nick is trying to play a big, big part in that. <laughs> and we'll provide, continue to provide a large amount of liquidity for a lot of the assets in the ecosystem. But uh, you know, to maybe preempting one of the future questions, I do think that it's uh, remain to see what exactly the most uh, where the most benefit will accrue. We have a lot of partners who think that it'll be things like mortgage securitizations or HELOC securitizations. You know, people like Figure have done five billion, ten billion dollars of securitizations on chain through uh, through provenance, and they, you know, it's their belief that uh, that has completely disrupted traditional financial uh, mortgage securitizations by saving the amount of money that it does just because of how complex those deals are, how bespoke they can make them for different risk profiles, and how easy that is to all do in the context of DeFi instead of having to go to 10 different service providers, getting them all to coordinate, and passing spreadsheets back and forth over email with an auditor looking, looking over all of that. You can just do it with smart contracts instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's what makes it really disruptive. And I think with that, there comes lots of technical roadblocks and, and replacing many of those systems. So, um, Cynthia, uh, I'd like to hand it back to you. Um, what are some of the technical roadblocks that you've seen, um, whether I was saying, we were saying earlier, like deciding which blockchain to deploy on or replacing some of these systems? You know, what have you seen and how have you helped overcome that? Yeah, I think the few unique challenges I think we all as uh, builders in this space need to overcome as a whole. Uh, the first one is uh, building enough on-chain liquidity so that mm -hmm. use cases, various use cases can happen around that. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg question because if you have the use cases, then you know, of course naturally you have the on-chain liquidity. And uh, so, so it's, it's how uh, at the early stage it's probably us like being the main liquidity provider bootstrapping the liquidity so that various applications can take that liquidity and uh, and use SCBT um, and uh, having the liquidity that they require to, to, to integrate. So that's one um, area that we have seen. The second uh, potential challenges, which I think we'll, we'll soon overcome, is really the price oracle, which is also part that we have discussed with the Chainlink price uh, data oracle team, is to find the right methodology to support the real world assets so that the price oracle can be like th this is a prerequisite that a lot of uh, integration actually needs to rely on. Um, but the price oracle max methodology for RWA token might be different from the crypto native token because the underlying has its own value, right? And the underlying asset actually probably have a deeper market liquidity than on-chain uh, liquidity 
of it. So what is the right way, what are the right me metrics to put into the price methodology? And maybe different uh, application, different lending protocols or trading protocols have their own consideration when it's come to the risk management around the other way. So they might want to pick and choose the right metrics for them. So maybe for this part, there need to be a more kind of a, a configuration that comes around the the price oracle that the protocols which is looking to integrate this pr price oracle can choose and, uh, uh, and can pick and choose. Yeah, so that's another thing I think would be uh, require a creative uh, uh, solution to to bring it to a much wider use case. Um, the third thing is probably the cross chain liquidity, right? Uh, as as the tokenized asset become more usable across different chains, the cross chain capability is definitely required. So I think the CCIP and the proof of reserve and the price oracle are the three very important pillars to support the growth of RWA. So I think a lot of the in the in innovative um, discussion need to happen uh, between the builders and the Chainlink team to pave the way for wider adoption. Yeah, absolutely. I think you'll hear a lot from uh, Chainlink Labs and, and through this conference about creating standards. And it's about creating standards for, for pricing information or proof of reserve information or even cross-chain communication for, for token passing and, and arbitrary messaging. And you know we think that's a large part of overcoming these technical hurdles. Um, I mean, so with that, we, we covered a lot of ground. Um, but something I hear a lot, and I wonder if any of you agree with this, is that a lot of people just say, like, let's just tokenize everything, right? From stable coins to, I don't know, your shoes. So I'd love to, to hear from you guys. You know, do you think we should tokenize everything? Do you agree or disagree? Or is there something that we haven't talked about that you think is a big use case that no one's talking about? Um, open floor for everyone who wants to address. I can start it off. Everyone's looking at me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how should we answer that one? Um, I think the probably one of the bigger, more difficult things to, to, to solve, which is like a ginormous opportunity, is private credit. Um, public debt, treasuries, stocks, things that have a price feed and an API are generally pretty straightforward to bring on chain and validate you know, the pricing and all of that. It's a pretty well built out infrastructure. The private debt side though is much more fragmented. Uh, it's less imperfect data uh, and building a mechanism that can kind of support and scale private credit, shorter duration private credit. I, I don't believe in tokenizing everything. I don't think 30 year mortgages will ever work on chain. Some of these, none of these chains have been around for 30 years, so. Um, but shorter duration private credit that has a very inefficient capital markets off chain um, paired with you know, highly efficient on-chain liquidity um, is sort of an explosion for success there. I think we just need protocols that can actually manage less liquid RWAs, um, which is something we're working on. I think it'll be fundamental for stable coins. I think you know, money markets will start to adopt these as well. Um, but there's a, there's a pretty large opportunity there as well. So no, not everything. But where there's demand, it will come on-chain. Great. Um, speaking of where there is demand, um, Erwin, I, I know that you've been working with um, equities. Um, what, what else have you seen as, as far as demand-wise? Because I, I think there's B assets for, for stocks as well. Um, we'd love to hear your perspective there. Yeah, so we, we've got, we built a pretty scalable uh, platform and we can tokenize pretty much anything that, uh, that is traded on an exchange, um, on a, uh, the LC or New York Stock Exchange, for example. Um, but right now, we, we're pretty much just seeing demand, or the bulk of the demand is, is for fixed income. And I would assume that this is here to, to stay. Um, when you look at the traditional finance, uh, fixed income is probably like, I don't know, 50% more than that? More than that. Um, but it's the bulk of the, of the market. Uh, and I would assume that we see the same in, um, in Web3. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we've got a bunch of products, um, and uh, our most successful one right now is uh, the US T-bill. Uh, probably second one is the equivalent, but for euros. Um, and uh, we'll keep adding more fixed income products, um, maybe go out on the uh, duration and, um, and have uh, different types of issues like corporates. Um, I think we'll stick to, to, 
public assets for now. Um, I want to, you know, uh, I think I, I can very much see uh, private uh, debt, common chain, and uh, for uh, blockchains to uh, to really uh, bring efficiency and, and savings uh, to those markets. But I just wonder, when you, when you look at the history, I mean, the first tokenized asset uh, that achieved scale is, was, is the US dollar. Now we're seeing the US T-bills. I just wonder whether uh, you know, private credit is the, the third one, or it's a bit further out, um, it's a question. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's like the short-term opportunity. I think it's sort of like the medium-term opportunity before like the longer-term one. I think obviously the most liquid things, things that people can get in and out of daily or close to it are gonna be the most easily adoptable, especially as people start getting used to it. It's a much easier collateral type. It's less volatile. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward product. Most like applications on chain are built for like liquid assets. They don't really have a mechanism to lock up duration. Um, so I totally agree with you. Um, I think stocks are going to be utilized. We can start adding them to perp markets and doing all sorts of creative things there. Um, but I do think like as the infrastructure improves, nominally stable coins, as those infrastructures improve, I think private credit sort of becomes a pretty large opportunity there. And to further back up Nick's point, uh, when we talk to a lot of institutions that use our data, a lot of them, they always point to the same things and that most of them are in private markets because they see the issues with lack of liquidity in private markets all the time. Uh, if you go to someone who has a stake in a you know, PE firm like KKR, let's say they want to sell that to their buddy, how do they do it? It's an enormously complicated and costly process that can't be done today, but if you bring that on chain, you know that is a costly process in and of itself, but once it's done once, it's very easy to transfer that, make a market in it. And so everyone points to fund stakes, uh, other types of funds that are very liquid. Private credit is a very big one. Private equity as well. Uh, overall, just uh, you can even see a lot of the papers that people cite for tokenization in TradFi is all transforming private markets, uh, and that they see that that as the, the main opportunity. But that's uh, you know underscored by the fact that everything has been done uh, with public assets so far, just because it's a, it is a lot easier and does have a lot of product market fit in the current DeFi ecosystem. Yeah. Other than public and private credits. Uh, we think a lot of, about the what would be the next to tokenize, even though we're not in a hurry to push a lot of product out of the door. But I think generally we believe there's a huge opportunity or enhancement of efficiency when we tokenize alternative investment assets because you help the greatly lower the cost of origination and circulation, and also you bring greatly. Um, um, bring more equitable access to it, right? So I think if in that in that dimension, we can think of precious metals, we can think of property markets in the prime locations in the prime cities of the world, we can think of uh, uh, fine wines and even some collectibles. Those would be interesting assets to be seen tokenized in the near future. All right. Well, we're at time already. I can't believe it. So. Everyone, thanks for joining, and stay tuned for all the great stuff these guys are producing. So thanks again. Thanks.